Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And this is a video that has been requested for quite a while now. It is What If Altists, How Family Structure Drives Ideology. I know you guys have been waiting for this one, Peter and Bhakti, you two especially, have been waiting quite a long time to see this video. But hey, here's the chance, finally got around to it. Um, the new Napoleon video comes out tomorrow on Epic History TV, so I'll be doing that one. So I figured, hey, let's get this video out of the way. You guys have been waiting for it. Thank you for your patience. And to be honest, I'm going into this one without really many expectations. I'd imagine that a lot of it's going to be focused on the family structure of the West. And I'd imagine how that probably leads, in his opinion, to some sort of, I don't know, decadence or social loneliness, isolation, something like this. I'm very curious because family structure obviously is important to the entire world. Every single nation on this planet, no matter where you are, the family plays a role in some way. So... Let's check out what what if Altist has to say for this one. And I lost my mouse. Over the course of the 20th century, it's been fascinating to see how different societies have reacted to the massive changes that have come from the Industrial Revolution and the pain of the world wars. However, much as people thought a single ideology like liberalism, communism, or the like might dominate the world, what happened instead was that Germany and Japan went for fascism, the Anglo-Saxon world in France stayed liberal, well, China, Russia, and the like went communist. What if I were to tell you that there was... I mean, what's interesting too is that the humanist wars of religion, ideologies of 1941, just one thing that is important to remember here is that all these are conquered lands. Right, so the only uh, nations that actually openly chose fascism would have been Italy, Germany, Hungary to an extent, arguably, you could say it's more authoritarianism, um, as well as Romania too. Just wanted to point that out. And Bulgaria is kind of the last, although they were a part of the Axis, they were in fact a monarchy led by Tsar Boris until his death and I believe I want to say 1943 or so. Um, just wanted to point that out there as well. Just looking at this map and... It's not like all these places chose fascism. Just want to point an that out. underlying scheme for why this happened, and it's almost certainly not what you think. The resemblances between what political ideologies a nation picks and its family structures <laughs> and many. Don't believe me? Flexible. This will be a tour to the world's family structures and how they inform right. broader politics. Prepare for an insane ride that will totally change how you view the world. Sure. I'm in. Let's do it. Who's the sponsors of today's video? Ah, what was, is it going to be enlisted? It might be enlisted. Let's see, though. In most societies, it's common for kids Hasn't to stay with their yet? parents for a long time into their adulthood. Much longer than we'd expect in the U.S. Given that we all have to make it on our own pretty early on in this country, it's important that we find intelligent ways to make and invest our money. Uh, here but we go. as we've seen this ah, year, traditional methods of nice. investing might not be as effective us. as they once were. Even crypto is taking a big hit. Oh, is this going to be for a is eating into American thing? savings, and the real estate market is on the verge of a major decline, as many people think. But there's one asset the wealthiest among us are all yeah, migrating to and have been putting cash work. into. One that's historically hedged yep. against inflation and economic. All right, there's there's some there's some s very sketch things about uh, masterwork. Uh, do your research before you look into it. I highly recommend checking out the Plain Bagels video on it in case you're ever interested. A lot of the content in this video comes from a single book, The Origins of yeah. Ideology by Emmanuel Todd. The book's short at around 170 pages, but it's really remarkable in encapsulating this whole theory. And the original idea behind it was posited but not articulated by the legendary French historian Fernand Braudel, who once said, the history of the world could be written just off family structure. And yeah. with this, I I'm essentially rebranding What If Altist to that show that jerks off and revives obscure <laughs> mid-20th century French historians. There are nice. eight different family structures around the world, and this video will go through each to explain what they are, the psychology that follows from it, and how they manifest. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Poor Quebec. Oh, no. Oh, okay. What, what, what did Quebec do? Politically. <laughs> Number one, the exogamous communitarian family. As a fair warning, a lot of these terms get fairly analytical and complicated, but I'll break them down to a more explainable level each time. What exogamous communitarian means is that the whole family lives together under the same roof or in the same clan. Communitarian okay. means people live largely in clans, rather than breaking away and forming individual nuclear families. Clan family structures are largely the norm across most of history and the world, with the exception of the West. 
Exogamous means okay. people marry outside their clan, so you shouldn't marry a cousin, but instead someone from a totally different family. The exogamous communitarian family dominates Russia, China, areas of Eastern Europe like former Yugoslavia, Hungary, and Finland, as well as northern India, Cuba, and parts of central France and Italy. So why not Romania, Greece? Okay. Sure. It's another piece of the evidence of the former Mongol Empire, Iron Curtain Block, being a broader cultural institution outside of just the Cold War or the modern Russo-Chinese alliance. This okay. is by far the largest family group in the world, where when Emmanuel Todd was writing in the 70s, it was 40% of the world's population, while all other groups hovered around 10% or less. The main reality of the exogamous communitarian family is just the stress that comes from having so many adult males and their wives under the same roof. When men get married, they bring their wives back home where they live under the same father, who can lord over and order his descendants around into adulthood until he dies. When the father dies, the family breaks okay. up and each son reforms a new household, lording over them as a grandfather in turn. Having this many adult males and their jealous wives who want more autonomy under the same roof breeds a lot of tension. Households like this have a lot of stress with so many families in proximity having to negotiate together. To deal with all this tension, the father has large amounts of power over the family. Likewise, in all of these cultures except Russia and Eastern Europe, women are treated very poorly since to resolve the tension of having so many- Wait, 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 hold on. I want to go back to that. Okay, Christendom buttoning up around sex and making extramarital nudity extremely taboo. German illness? Polish illness? I don't understand. Okay, so the German illness leads to the pol- Okay, making Islam is making women stay in their home and be veiled. Frankish illness? Okay, I... But also Widowburn. Okay. Sure, okay. Russia and Eastern Europe, women... Somehow still having mass sex slavery. Fair enough point, I guess. ...are treated very poorly, since to resolve the tension of having so many people having to live together, and the resentment of the sons being ruled over by their father, is to let the sons oppress their wives. The exogamous communitarian world has been the worst place for women of any large society in the world. This family system ingrains an idea of unfair power, and thus it's no surprise that these societies have always been absolutist kings or dictatorships, whether under Russia's czars, the cruel dynasties of northern India, or China's emperors. A great example of this is the bad emperor problem, as Francis Fukuyama talks about in The Origins of Political Order, in that China's political establishment was largely more advanced than the rest of the world, except for that their leaders had no accountability which hmm. then resulted in them making horrifically dumb decisions holding all their societies back. At the same time, the sheer amount of power the older father had over his sons prevents the idea of political independence or the individual from developing. So one thing that I'm curious about, like I'm, I'm with them for all of this, but I just don't understand how Finland would be included in this. And as I've talked about in previous videos before, you know, I spent a lot of time in Finland. It's my most visited country, or actually it's tied with the United States. Um, I just, I'm not tracking on how that applies to Finnish culture at all. And like, maybe that's just, I don't know, maybe like 60 years ago or so. That could be tar entirely possible. To be fair, this was written in the 1970s, but I'd be curious if any of you guys have maybe more historical context with this, is that that's how it also was in Finland back in times. Because now, obviously, Finland being a part of the, what would you say, the Nordic system, I suppose. It's obviously one of the most egalitarian and, you know, um, um, yeah, one of the most egalitarian, egalitarian societies on earth. So maybe there's something that I'm missing here, though, with history. The parents literally pick their son's mates and then live with them, with them providing their children work. With this attitude common, it's easy to see how regimes in this part of the world treat their populations often like cannon fodder, with service periods for conscripts in the Russian army of 25 years common under the czars, and before that, for life, and how Chinese emperors would call up massive parts of their population for vanity projects like the Great Wall, the Terracotta Army, or for giant armies of millions. With that sure. many people trying to coordinate working together, you need to enforce some kind of conformity in order just so weird inconsistencies with your relatives' personalities don't drive you crazy. For these reasons, these cultures prize conformity, discipline, and fitting into a mold rather than creativity. This is a big reason why Confucianism, an ideology that prizes following social duties above 
above all else and respect for authority has become China's de facto religion for most of its history. Likewise, the idea of the father as a symbol for the family results in state worship being normal in this part of the world. In Russia, the state was viewed as the vehicle of glory and identity for the entire Russian race. Well, in China, the state's literally viewed as sacred under Confucian law and the manifestation of the will of the Chinese people. You can explain a lot of historic quirks looking in <laughs> this lands. For it says here, all, all paths of, of Marxism lead toward Moscow, therefore CDU. So this is a, um, I think this is a, um, this is a post-war poster um, that's sort of saying that like the SPD and other things like this, all their red left-wing politics they're all going to lead to Moscow, so therefore you should vote for the CDU, which is the Christian Democratic Union. For example, the West's incomprehensibility to Russia and horror at Russia's lack of freedom, cruelty, and what has been seen as its oriental character. While at the same time, the Russians have been physically indistinguishable from other Europeans and Christians. It all makes more sense in between okay. arranged marriages, clan life, and rule by a strong patriarch. The Russians lived lives much... So this is actually going to be one thing that I was going to think of. So you're talking about the father as the symbol in these societies. Yes, true. But don't a lot of these really come from the religion as well, right? Obviously, the father um, being a very prominent figure in Christianity, not only in, in symbolism, but also in the, in, the, in the stories as well. So I wonder how much of this is really influenced by religion as well and how much these... Because he hasn't talked about that yet. There is another 40 minutes to go, so <laughs> I'll let it go, but... I, th I think religion would play a large role in this too, no? ...more like that of Asians than Europeans. Russia did, however, give women much better treatment, more in line with European standards than Asian ones. I do wonder if Todd was correct in labeling all yeah, of European Romania. areas he did as being part of this group. Yeah. Looking from See, their yeah. history Finland. and how they developed the societies and how arranged marriage has been incredibly rare across Western history, I doubt the Baltics are part of this group. But when he was writing in the 70s, they were part of the Soviet Union, meaning the Soviets would have suppressed data showing cultural differences from the Russians mm. and said data would have been pretty hard to find in the West anyway. Likewise, yeah. Fin yeah, and same with, well, he's about to talk about Finland, but I wonder why, he, again, Another thing that's important to note is that this isn't what if alt history really saying this yet, it's rather the author. So why would the author then exclude Romania from that as well? Finland was a nomadic herder society until recently, which was extremely loose and free dealing. So I kind of doubt it functioned in reality close to China or northern India. Yeah, exactly. One of the jokes in the What If Altis staff is India is the exception to every rule in history. If you want to make any kind of principle about the past, just write India out, since there's no way it will conform, and it'll just keep doing its India thing. India doesn't conform to a lot of the principles of these kinds of societies. Nations. India doesn't really have self-imposed native tyrannies or strong government and the like. However, the collectivism and poor treatment of women does carry, and I think this is due to the caste system, which is a bigger factor. For more details on the caste system, watch my video on India, but long and short, every person's life in Indian history has been ruled by caste, or their tiny self-contained occupational group they must breed in, work in, associate in, and the like. And this caste system has overwrought the powerful pro-government forces that you normally see from exogamous communitarian societies. The exogamous communitarian world has gone for communism very strongly in the 20th century for reasons that may seem obvious given this movement's emphasis on authority, cooperation, and conformity. In fact, you really struggle to find any successful self-contained communist movements outside of this cultural area. The map of the exogamous communitarian world, excepting yeah. India, sure. are basically the same as the second world communist bloc during the Cold War. Yugoslavia, and especially Cuba, totally cut off from the rest of the world with very different geography and culture, but still being exogamous communitarian societies are very strong evidence for this. On top of this, the Italian and French communist parties were based out of the parts of their countries that had exogamous communitarian societies and were very weak outside of those blocs. But it's not the same. Am I missing something here? Anyways. There are three big reasons why communism is so appealing to exogamous communitarian societies. One being that the father's rule creates resentment among the brothers, who can rebel against the father, which seems like a perfect corollary to the rebellion of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. Most societies' conceptions of God and the government deviate from how fathers act in their society, and so resentment against the father naturally leads to communism's atheism. The pent-up resentment against the father, once the sons gain power, which 
promulgates further tyranny, seems like a perfect model for how the resentful communists filled the shoes of the already cruel and corrupt regimes they replaced. The second reason being that the structure of families in the societies is that once the father dies, the family breaks up and each son becomes his own family, immediately tearing up the family. This is a great corollary to how the nation is torn up in the Great Revolution and culture totally changes. Likewise, the massive cultural changes that have happened with stuff like Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Chi Shi Huang Di, and Zhu Huangxi, all predating communism, as well as later communists like Stalin and Mao, make sense given since the families totally reform every generation, erasing its history, it creates the idea that the nation can do the same as well. The third... But then couldn't you say the same too to any sort of monarchist structures as well? Is it any sort of king, any sort of, uh, you know, powerful authoritarian ruler, right? This is a lot to digest. This is... This is very hard to do an initial reaction on because you have to, I have to really think more about this, but I'm sort of following along what he's saying here, though. This is, this is interesting. The reason being that in exogamous communitarian families, the family picks the mate occupation and governs the children through their whole adult lives until their parents die. And thus it intuitively makes sense that the state, which is the manifestation of the family, would provide the citizen with everything across their whole lives, which is communism. Part two. And Again, that's oh, that's so much to digest. This is always the problem with doing these kinds of videos. Possible History did a video where he sort of did a reply to What If Altist. I think it was, oh, what was the video? Maybe it was the borders of the 21st century or something like that. It's the 22nd century, maybe. But if you when you don't have the time to sit there and really pick apart each argument, it's very difficult to do so. Ah, let's keep going on this one. But I can understand why you guys wanted to see this one. It's 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 a lot. Endogamous communitarian. We're moving from one type of clan structure to another, this time from those who marry outside their clan to inside it. In endogamous communitarian societies, people marry their third cousin in arranged marriages and then live together as a clan under the same roof. This may sound like a tiny difference, but it's had profound effects around how these cultures have evolved over time. The endogamous communitarian world is the same as the Islamic world, Jock. Couldn't you argue that, like, the Habsburg would be the same thing, though? Like, couldn't you argue that any of the sort of, I mean, probably the Habsburgs being the most famous one, but any sort of monarch inbreeding is that they really, too, marry within their own clan as well? I don't know how that would exclusively go to the, to the uh, Islamic world here. I would think, arguably, that um, that sort of form of, of monarchism that we had would be the same thing, no? Geography. I mean, I could sugarcoat that a little by saying the Islamic world is bigger with some stuff in Africa, Bangladesh, or Malaya. But for the most part, the borders of the Islamic world exactly match this region. If communism is the classic ideology for exogamous communitarian societies, Islam is that for this one. This is since the structure of Islam fits well with the social conservatism that comes from internally bound clan life. One of the key differences between Islam okay. and Christianity is that Jesus said, love thy neighbor and don't be a douche, and then got crucified. <laughs> Meanwhile, Muhammad created a legal code, founded an empire, and transcribed the exact words of God. Christianity believed that God's law is written in our hearts and up for interpretation, while Islam believes the Quran is literally the word of God itself and should be followed without question. Islam was able to conquer and maintain control over this area due to the shared family structure that worked well with its ideology. The Muslims kept control of Turkey and lost control of Spain and converted Pakistan but not India, since the local family structures uh, meshed yeah. better with Islam. This works for the conservative. I wouldn't say that's just because of the family structure though, right? Like. Again, I'm not going to speak on this because I'm not an expert. I'll probably get a bunch of things wrong because it's Indian history and I'm completely ignorant about Indian history. But I really thought it was more like there were attempts, obviously, for the Muslim world to then encroach on territory in the traditional um, Hindu world. But again, I don't think it was just as simple as that. Herbatism that comes from these kinds of societies. Bringing in outside wives causes immense social tension in the exogamous families, but since you're marrying your fourth cousin, it's all map? in the family and pretty frictionless since everyone knows everyone else and is related. There's a quote from an Arab that sounds strange to Western ears of, I love her since she's my second cousin through my uncle. 
Islam provides what was that map? <laughs> stable laws for fundamentally unchanging and conservative clan societies. An interesting and massive difference between exogamous and endogamous clan societies is that since the whole clan stays intact through inbreeding, there's a lot less power and tension in the father's hands. Since the family is so intact that upbringing and family discipline doesn't just fall on the father's hands, given there are so many uncles, cousins, and grandfathers lying around. The Islamic father is not an overbearing force, just a part of an interconnected web of family that encompasses all of life. Thus, the idea of atheism is unimaginable to the Muslim world, which has always been religious. Likewise, the moral laws that govern interpersonal relations inside the clan cannot be blamed on a single force since they're upheld by all males. This is shown that the religious laws of the Islamic world are maintained by a council of male elders called the ulama, rather than the pope or a mm. hierarchical church as in the West. Something a lot of Westerners don't believe is that historically the Muslim world has, of the four main Eurasian civilizations, treated women the third worst after India and then China. A woman in the Muslim world isn't a dangerous outsider to be controlled, as in those other two societies, but a beloved cousin to be taken care of. Not to say the Muslim world's great, but this lack of tension is why female liberation has not occurred in the Muslim world, but has in much of the rest of the world. Islam conceptualizes the world through the clan. When the greatest Islamic historian Ibn Khaldun wrote a history of the world, he did it through the lens of the moral strength of the strongest clan, determining the success of the nation. The clan allows great treatment of insiders. When I've been to Muslim countries, I've been shocked at how hospitable and casually kind they have been. That's true. I never felt threatened traveling in Egypt and was shocked no one tried to sell me shit or get in my face. Likewise, it's shocking to go to dirt poor Muslim countries and see no beggars since the clans take care of their own. However, that's one thing, actually. So I go to a spa cafe here in Vienna, which is basically a language cafe. And a lot of the times, the people that are there, they're from Syria and things. And we talked about hospitality. And one of the things about hospitality that I would say that Austrians have less than Canadians. I'll just talk about Austrians, but less than Canadians, um, is that the, hospitable, the hospitality shudal, that, that Austrians have is a lot less than those in the Muslim world. Right. And again, the Muslim world is huge, but at least from the people that I was talking about that are in Syria, um, you know, they'd say like if, if someone's out, um, if you walk around the neighborhood and you walk by someone's house, you have to then go into their house. Right. You have to have tea with them and greet them and everything like this. And that it's very, very tied socially. And it's a lot of it's very warm um, and it's, it's very yeah hospitable in comparison to some of the one to the more sort of closed off individualist western societies here where you know my friend lives literally next door to me in the in the building over but i don't go to his house all the time or anything like this right so yeah i just wanted to, to comment on that with a bit of personal experience or at the same time since the clan doesn't interface with the rest of society at all really these societies have often been terrible to outsiders Islam was the only one of the major four Eurasian civilizations to practice slavery in a truly massive scale until very recently, and still does in small ways. Even today, if you border a Muslim country, you have twice as high a chance of being at war than an average religion. The Muslim idea of violence... No, yeah, but I mean, that... Mm, okay, I see spreading the house of family... Is that Lord of the Rings with ISIS? <laughs> <laughs> he get this stuff? of islam dar al islam <laughs> okay. seems like the way clans you the world through yeah, expanding their the genes part, part three the authoritarian family yeah and i mean again it's uh this is so much and this is so hard to do an on the spot like you know what i mean here it's not quite like we're watching a history video and talk about the facts and go from here it's like there's a lot. Right. In Keep some going. ways, I feel like the authoritarian family is the this weirdest is ideologically and geographically, and that's partially by design. For a lot of these family groups, they have a single ideology that kind of encompasses their worldview, with the notable previous examples being Islam and communism. Likewise, they have a single block of coherent territory, whether Dar al Islam. I mean, isn't there a ton of time missing here between the formal Mongol Empire? And communism, which is within living memory, communism is within the living memory, right? Obviously, the, the you know the the Russian Revolution being 1917, not in living memory anymore. But you know what I mean. There's thousands, millions of people that still remember living under communist regimes in Europe. But then, between the Mongol Empire too, you know what I mean. And this is where my history is sort of failing me, because I really only know up to about 1800 or so. But 
there's a huge time period here that seems to be missing that's really that I'm not quite seeing the conclusion here. You know what I mean? Um, or the former Mongol Empire. However, for the authoritarian culture, there is no such unity. Why the culture is this family style as part of includes <laughs> the Koreans, back? Japanese, Germans, Jews, Scandinavians, North Spanish, Gypsies, Occitan, Walloons, Celtic peoples like the Scots, Irish, Breton, or the Quebecois in Canada. Likewise, they why the Quebecois? They followed political ideologies ranging from fascism, nationalism, democratic socialism, hard Catholicism, and the like. However, once you dig a bit deeper, you find a broader cultural unity that makes all this diversity a feature, not a bug. In authoritarian families, only the oldest son inherits. The rest get nothing and have defined their way in the world. Many of these sons end up in the priesthood or in the military, and these cultures often have a combination with warrior monks like in Ireland, the Teutonic Knights, or Zen Samurai. All these young people needing to push out to establish themselves makes these societies often irrationally aggressive. This worldview where only the oldest son inherits okay. naturally leads to these cultures viewing inequality as a natural part of the world, and so every naturally fascist country... Yeah, again... Ugh. Sure, I guess. But then there's nothing there for Greece. The Nordics don't count. Yeah, I don't know about this one here, right? All the Nordics don't count. The UK doesn't count. Canada doesn't count. That's a spicy topic, though, that's even spicy to this day, is fascism support in Quebec during the 1930s, but we won't go there. Tree in the world has come from one of these cultures. This includes Hitler's Germany, Imperial Japan, two countries that share very little except this family structure. Franco's Spain was based out of the author. Yeah, but they also they also had ideas about imperialism, right? So the ideas of Japanese imperialism and the the ideas of you know the German imperialism were very 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 strong throughout the founding of said nations. In Japan, it's obviously a longer story. Japan, in the, in its modern sense, is I mean, how old of a nation do you want to consider it? Right, but Germany certainly, um, you know, it was always with this intention of expansion, this intention of militarism and the militaristic ideologies. How much of that really comes from the family structure? Right, um, I'm not entirely sold, but I can understand the, the, the links that they're really settling here. Artarian north of that country and Mussolini's Italy is the only outlier, but they also fill part of the egalitarian. I mean, the other thing too is that within the South, right, for, for Franco, the majority of the, um, of the fascist support actually came from the South of Spain, right? There were bits in the North, of course, but the majority of the support did come from the South. The nuclear model we'll talk about in the next section of Macho Strongmen. And also, they were the least effective of all the fascist states. Since the ancestral line gets passed on from father to eldest son, it creates the idea of an indestructible lineage that must be preserved at all costs, bar nothing. These countries have a deep sense of history and stubbornness that allows survival and nationalism seeming normal, even noble. The idea of erasing history that comes naturally to the endogamous community structure seems disgusting and perverse to cultures in the authority-based family structure. A point Emmanuel Todd makes is that the Jews and Gypsies have very little in common except they share this family structure, and they've faced centuries of horrifying depredations that gave them every right to lose their culture. However, for these societies, okay. losing the ancestral lineage is disgusting. This is why these cultures are all these tiny dots on the map, since they just fucking refuse to die. I'm half Irish, and my mom's <laughs> side's got a good amount of Scottish, and uh. this is a part I understand from my own family basis. My father's a bit of an Irish nationalist, and he'd sing me rebel songs as a child, and my friends sometimes make fun of me for, Rudyard, why do you keep holding on to this Irish stuff given your family's been in America for 200 years, and your other half is British, who are the Irish's greatest enemies. Yeah. And it's since an Irish culture, the idea of throwing away a lineage that stretches back to Cucullian and beyond, and your ancestors struggled centuries to protect seems unimaginable. This is how the English stole the Irish's land, kept them from owning property, obtaining an education, voting, and starving them. However, yeah. with each humiliation, the Irish just grew tougher, building their entire personality around rebellion. These kinds of cultures instill... Yeah, I mean, it's certainly one of the underdog, to say the least. A lot of discipline among their members. 
An example being suicidal bravery. Look at how in impossibly horribly outnumbered conflicts like the Germans or Japanese in World War II, the heavily Scottish descended Confederates in the US Civil War, or the Jews rebelling against the Romans, of how authoritarian cultures are willing to basically commit suicide for their own pride. I mean, again, though, right? It's not. I see what he's. I see what he, what the author is really going for here, and I I want to be totally on the side. But again, within the Second World War, when you're fighting on homeland, I think regardless of the family structure, that that's going to exist, right? Any time that you're fighting for your own home and you're dying on your own soil to protect what you love. That suicidal bravery, that unrelinquishing, you know, um, will for victory really comes out. If we look at what's happening right now in 2023 with the Ukrainian-Russian war, you have the Ukrainians that are dying on their own soil to protect their home, right? And I just, uh, you know, it just, I think that regardless of the family structure, that this phenomenon is going to happen. But I don't know. Let me know what you think on this part so far. I mean, I grew up assuming that a society's willingness to fight suicidally like this for something profound like national survival or honor was something deeply noble. And then I talked to friends, and their reaction was, that just sounds insane. To which my reaction was, how can you not get this? I don't know. I don't really think it sounds insane, but... This discipline manifests in politics as well, in which once these societies make a decision, their entire culture moves in lockstep to change immediately. The cultures that have gone through the fastest transitions are all in this category. This includes Japan and Germany's post-World War II 180 degree turns, Scotland and Japan's insanely rapid industrializations, or Quebec and Ireland's extremely rapid shifts from extremely Catholic to being very secular. The way these societies get this much discipline... <laughs> well, at least for Quebec, that was, that was a very, very long transition that took a while. I mean, the Quiet Revolution is what it's called in Quebec, where slowly the influence of the Catholic um, Church was sort of rooted out of society to this point where they're so vehemently secular that it's... Um, it's really a, a, an identifying point of Quebecois culture. And so, again, whether this all ties to the family structure, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not quite convinced, but I like the arguments. And it's through the idea that their ancestral lineage goes back into infinity. Something I was unironically told as a child was that as the only male heir to my family, the honor and survival of my entire ancestral line hung on my shoulders. Also, with the oldest son taking everything from his father, it creates an immense amount of pressure the parents put on the oldest son. Sure. With the rest of the children growing up with the same atmosphere, but with the expectation of making it in the rest of the world. The amount of pressure these parents apply on their children creates a lot of weird neuroses, making these cultures remarkably not chill. With the weird eccentricities <laughs> of the Japanese, Jews, Germans, Irish, and the rest, likely stemming from these overbearing parents. An interesting point Todd Emanuel makes about Freud's theories of hatred of the father stemming as much from Freud's cultural context as a German Jew than anything else. Yeah. Hey. These neuroses sure. manifest in society with Emanuel Todd making an interesting correlation between areas in Germany that burned the most witches in the 1600s and those who supported the Nazis, and they're the same areas. Both witch burnings and the Nazis are fundamentally paranoid neuroses. Wait, wait, wait. Why are there... Ah, that's annoying. I'm going to assume this is probably... I'm going to assume this is probably 1930 and then this is 1932. But anyways. The overbearing and unequal family does have a lot of advantages. It always amuses me when feminists push for collectivism given women do much better in individualistic societies in which they pair off with a single man and use their sex as leverage rather than clans where they have no such leverage and are pawns of their elders. These authoritarian societies tend to give women authority sure. as part of the ruling couple pair, and thus they tend to prize education. Also, since family lands are divided up every generation, these countries often have large middle classes. The global middle class. Oh, okay, the global middle class. An important point to make is that even though this is called the authoritarian system, these countries tend to not be as authoritarian for controlling the individual as lots of other systems, notably the exogamous communitarian, and that's because their societies have so much discipline that it's difficult for the government to lord over the individual. And if you okay. look at countries like Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, 
They weren't that horrible to the very Japanese or Germans that they ruled under, but leveled their hatred at conquered populations. These countries tend to view God and government in the same way, with an okay. overbearing force that expects dignity and respect. The most socially conservative Catholic areas have tended to be in this region, while big government paternalistic socialism tends to predominate in areas that aren't Catholic. These countries tend to be pretty uniparty political systems since one grows up and gets deep loyalty to a certain political party, and parties live and die on a generational basis, with the True. same parties ruling in, say, Sweden, Japan, or Quebec, and the like for whole generations. Oh, Quebec politics is, uh, is a whole other ballgame compared to the rest of every other province in, uh, in Canada, and I'll, I'll spare you guys on it, but... Generally, there's three or four parties in each province. Generally, there's a Liberal Party, an NDP, um, a Conservative, and a, uh, a Green Party, generally. And then in Quebec, there's like six different parties and only one of two of them, which is the NDP, correction, sorry, the Conservatives and the Liberals are somewhat similar to the federal one. And even then, they have sometimes wildly different ideas than they do from the federal party. So it's kind of interesting. The largest flaw of the authoritarian model is the overweening pride that comes from believing their ancestral group is the center of the universe and all others <laughs> are useless. These countries make terrible empires. And if you look at Western Europe, it's never the authoritarian areas that unify countries. When they try to form empire- Well, I mean, arguably though, is that these authoritarian units can, can unify their own country, right? Such as you look at the, the Italians here through the multiple wars of Italian reunification. German reunification, which Germany was, 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 uh, what's the quote? Ah, I'm going to forget it, but it's basically Germany was formed in blood, right? Whereas when you look at Canada, Canada was formed over alcohol, really alcohol and discussion. Um, yeah, so uh, France is a little bit, bit different, but certainly with Germany, it was a nation that was, it was, it was formed in the middle of a war, right? So, you know, I think that also has a unique sense of itself, but chicken or the egg, right? How much of this does the family structure play? I'm saying, you know, who knows? There's coalitions of literally I think everyone this is cool, in their I actually like this video. Tries to form to prevent them from winning. It's not a coincidence that the ancient Greek city-states, which were authoritarian family structure, were never able to forge large empires while the egalitarian Roman family structure, starting in a tiny city in the Tiber sure. River, was able to conquer the known world. Likewise, even inside their <laughs> own countries, these nations have been terrible at maintaining political unity given they're so split by local governments and families that imagine themselves as special and infinitely stretching back into history. The Celts have never been able to unify independently of conquest, and the Irish make jokes about how difficult it is to make them work together. <laughs> the Germans and Japanese have been split into tiny states for large parts, if not most, of their modern histories. Circling back to the beginning, the reason the authoritarian family is split into so many tiny splotches around the world, and has split so many ideologies, is they can't unify or spread easily, but they're also so impossibly hard to get rid of. Number four, the egalitarian <laughs> nuclear family. Now we move on to the nuclear family, something that seems like go. gets mentioned on a daily basis by Americans, which as you'll see makes sense with how much it drives society. But there are two separate kinds of nuclear family, both of which evolve into democratic capitalist societies, but one with inherently different characters. The egalitarian nuclear family is based out of much of Italy, excepting the middle little bit. Southern Iberia, most of northern France, Romania, okay. Poland, Ethiopia, and the mostly white so or mestizo parts of Latin Romania. America. The egalitarian nuclear family works through a nuclear family, or the mother and father move away and live as a separate couple, and then upon their death, their inheritance is divided up equally among all the sons. This sort of worldview creates an inherent tension between freedom and equality, which are inherently contradictory since once you start to give people freedom to act as they would like, they start to achieve different results, thus not allowing equality. In nuclear families, people move away from their parents and marry through love, not arranged marriages. And thus, there's an idea of an individual in freedom, but also since all the sons inherit equally, 
there's an idea that people deserve economic equality as a sense of fairness to a certain degree. This worldview is largely encapsulated in the French Revolution's Egalité, Liberté, Fraternité, or Equality, Liberty, and Brotherhood. <laughs> Across this and the next section will be strongly compared to the English-speaking world's inegalitarian yes. nuclear system and its life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These countries often have a socialistic government redistributionist bent to them, and that they view the idea of the government redistributing the wealthiest money to the poor as an ethical, natural thing. And so they often see the tension, especially in Latin American <laughs> countries, between redistributionist demagogues and technocrats who want to establish capitalism to a greater degree and alternating between them. The ideology of this region could be called revolutionary liberalism, with the French Revolution followed by Napoleon being its perfect encapsulation. A problem here is that, ironically, unlike the authoritarian societies that tend to prize inequality but actually tend to be fairly equal and have a strong middle yeah. class, in these countries, since lands divided equally, it means that each generation lands are divided, meaning lots of families that can't feed themselves and have to sell their land, which results in the wealthy buying up their small uninhabitable lands. These societies prize equality as an abstract, but have a social code that actively promotes inequality, which causes revolutions. This critical mm. tension means that these societies often oscillate between military dictatorships and used to have chill absolutist monarchies and democracies. <laughs> Chill absolutist monarchy. What a, what a, yeah. <laughs> Through the history of a Latin American country, Italy, France, Spain, and the like, over the last 200 years is an endless litany of regime changes in monarchy, military dictatorship, and democracy. France I mean, I'd be kind of curious, though, of where he thinks that, like, Austria would fall on this, because Austria is a very unique example where they were not split. They were ruled by the single family for hundreds of years, barring a brief interruption. And yet a lot of this could also apply to the Austrians as well, right? So, hmm. France has had five republics with different constitutions, while the U.S. has remained under the same constitution for a longer period. However, these societies still value the individual in their search for a life. I mean, arguably, too, it's not the same constitution because they added constitution. They added constitutional amendments to it, but whatever. And so they actually, yeah, no, it's not the same constitution at all, really. Like, if, if you look at all the constitution amendments that have been done to it, it's not really the same. To respect property rights in the general functioning society more so than other groups. A strong part of this kind of nuclear family missing in the English speaking world's version is the brotherhood that comes from all the brothers inheriting equally while the daughters get nothing. This creates a culture of machismo that comes from the idea that the men are literally superior in these societies. These cultures produce preening alpha males as dictators on a frequent basis. However, since everyone inherits equally no matter what, said preening alpha males are often not actually effective since they have no incentive to be. This culture of male solidarity also predisposes these countries to be military dictatorships when not democracies, given the male solidarity that also exists in the military. These cultures... I mean, that's interesting, but then if you look at the history of Britain, I mean, it's how long you go back, right? Obviously, there were points of absolute monarchy. There's that brief thing with Cromwell where it was briefly a republic, but then it's been a parliamentary um, uh, democracy for now hundreds of years, really. So... Does it really fall into this? How long are we looking at for a scope of history? Find the insane discipline expected of the authoritarian society's distaste. Oh, oh this is going to be a long video. Full. And as the Catholic Church became more conservative in the Counter-Reformation, have tended towards chill Catholicism and general secularism among the men, while women have often been religious. From a world perspective, being part of nuclear families of a man and wife stuck together, women have a lot of de facto influence in these societies, given that they have lots of negotiating power over their husbands due to sex and running the household. The idea of brotherhood allows these societies to become very successful empires through the idea that all citizens of the empire are inherently brothers. All the Latin states in Western Europe are built off these egalitarian parts, conquering the other regions while the Roman Empire is kind of the OG egalitarian empire, okay. with all sons inheriting equally, thus allowing a How sense Britain? of brotherhood among How all Britain? men of the empire, allowing mass assimilation of conquered peoples, unlike the Greeks, as well as...
How does this not fall in for the UK, though? The Republic degrading into military dictatorships. As a final note, Ethiopia's inclusion in this list is fascinating. It shows that this family system almost certainly stems from Christianity, with Joseph Heinrich talking about this in his fabulous book, The Weirdest People in the World. It also explains why Ethiopia has been the only stable state in sub-Saharan Africa for thousands of years, and why it's the only big country in sub-Saharan Africa to be industrializing, alongside its oscillations between democracy and military dictatorship. Over the next couple decades, I would watch out for Ethiopia. Part 5. The Absolute Nuclear sure. Family The Absolute Nuclear Family could also be called the Anglo-Saxon without much of a stretch. Since it exists in England, right, it's so the countries countries like the US, England Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Alongside this, the countries the Anglo-Saxons came from on the European continent, such as the Netherlands, Denmark, as well as Normandy and Anjou, which colonized England. Its dominant ideology is liberal capitalism. For most of my viewers, the absolute nuclear family doesn't need much explanation, given it's the system we just assume to be normal. A family True. forcing a mother and a father from love, not arranged marriage, moves away from their parents, and the parents can divide up their inheritance however they would like. Yep. Just inheriting children that piss them off, giving kids they like more inheritance, etc. Each child is expected to find their own way in the world, and it's nice if they happen to inherit something from their parents. The de facto reality has often been an egalitarian split inheritance among the common people, and the authoritarian oldest son inherits all among the nobility, making this cultural system culturally between authoritarian and egalitarian nuclear family systems, which makes sense given Britain's history of shared German and French colonization. It combines parts of the pressure and discipline of the authoritarian system and part of the globalizing and free spirit of the egalitarian nuclear family. An interesting point Emmanuel okay. Todd made is that these countries were often deeply racist in the manner of an authoritarian country until the middle of the 19th mm, century, the and screen. the working classes gained more influence over the aristocrats, from which they moved to more universal views. The dominant assumption of cultures like this is that each individual is an atom responsible for its own success and conduct, responsible for its own results, and if someone succeeds, good for them. Your own life is in your own hands, as long as you don't totally fail and become a weirdo, <laughs> and then get rejected from the broader social system, or getting disinherited. Something Anglos have trouble understanding and why their social models model is so hard to apply to the rest of the world is that this cultural system often appears alien and bizarre, if not disgusting to other cultures. The atomization is often viewed as inherently cold and impersonal. I've talked to Frenchmen yeah. and they've tried to impart upon me how inherently disgusting the amount of wealth of America's billionaires is, in of itself, to which my reply is, I'm happy they're able to succeed to that level. The absolute nuclear family promotes rife capitalism, and the idea that the end result is fair, even if it's unequal, gives these societies immense stability, since it can reconcile equality and freedom by going with freedom. The English-speaking world, the Netherlands fair. and Denmark, sure. really don't have rebellions, crises, or political instability. Meanwhile, the idea that everyone mm, had. <laughs> has to play the capitalism and democracy game gives an onus to make the system fair and functional, given that that's I mean, British British history, definitely. U.S., I mean, arguably almost did happen. Danish don't know about, and then the Dutch, yeah, there's some. The structure of their families. I mean, insanely stable in comparison to the rest of Europe, for sure. Of providing children with equal upbringings and then expecting unequal results. This idea of free choice manifests under capitalism, liberalism, and Protestantism, which believes the individual's connection with God is personal, and means these were the first countries in the world to become multi-party democracies yep. or have religious freedom in the Western world. Yep. The ideas of God in these societies are that how you worship God is up to you, and God judges you for going to heaven and hell upon your death based off the multiform choices you've made in your life without a state-sponsored or Catholic church necessary, which sounds a lot like a parent judging their child on whether or not they should inherit after their death. These cultures have to have high social trust and stability given that the individual cannot expect anything from their families, which are in turn cut off from their extended families, which means that people have to turn to other communities like churches, bowling leagues, and the like to fish for friends and social bowling networks leagues. as well as employers and employees. These cultures tend to have a lot of unity, given how isolated people are from their families and need to rely on the community. At the same time, with the collapse of social communities like this, as seen in Bowling alone, the negative effects in society have been incalculable. Since each individual is viewed as... I think a lot of that has to do with technology, though. And then one, one of his videos, the, um, 
think it was how the internet will change everything or something along these lines. Um, he really went into discussion about that one. I think that technology has a huge, huge role in this one. So an atom in these societies, these countries' foreign policies tend to be isolationist in principle <laughs> and actually very interventionist in actions since everything is up to independent and personal choice. England, the Netherlands, and America have all played the game of proclaiming oh glorious isolationism or refusing foreign entanglement. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson claimed to be uh, isolationist. He was certainly not. And then bombing anyone that pisses them off and making giant alliance coalitions in the same way as the people in their societies. For all these reasons, the absolute nuclear family has been the most successful in history. It's gone from a group of tiny marshlands in the North Sea to ruling the world. These are incredibly wealthy, successful, capable, and stable countries. I'd like to hazard some modesty here, given that the wheel of history eventually pones everyone, and so we'll probably eventually see a lot of flaws in this family structure that we can't now. But sure. I kind of find it amusing Emmanuel Todd literally gives this culture, which dominates the world, two pages in his 170-page book, <laughs> since it fits so perfectly in the French historiographic tradition of not being able to admit how hard the Anglos beat them. Part 6, <laughs> Asymmetric Families. Nice. I'm going to warn all of you that this is the one that makes the least sense of all of them to me. This family okay. system is based out of southern India and is based off the assumptions born out of that culture, and especially the caste system. The way it works, you can only marry the cousins of your female relatives through their female relatives, which works through arranged marriage. What? People then live in families as built through their mother's female relatives. I've never heard of this in my life. I, I don't think I'll have anything to say over the next 13 minutes. <laughs> in this process, the uncle, or your mother's brother, becomes her male protector who helps manage this system. This means that uncles are super important to child's development. It's hard at times to disentangle this system okay. from just the broader Indian cultural context, which I cover in greater detail in these videos. However, there are some important details that separates this part of India from northern India. This is opposed to northern India, which has possibly been the area where women have been the worst treated in the world over history. Firstly, this part okay. of India is much wealthier and more creative, with India's tech center being based out of... If anyone's Indian, write in the comment section moving forward of, of this is, if this is a fair assessment or not, because I don't have a clue, and I'm not even going to pretend to have a clue. Bangalore, for example. This makes sense given women are treated much better in southern India and in societies which women are given more social status. They can bring their ideas into society, but also it forces men to try harder in order to impress them. This part of India has also had the only successful communist movements ever in world history, with the only democratically elected communist movements ever, which have not in turn turned themselves into totalitarian states. In, in another kind of argue France too though they didn't have a majority but anyways example of India mm, no wait I think they did actually I'll have to look into that more yeah breaking every rule have actually been very good government making West Bengal and Tamil Nadu peaceful and successful societies number seven the anomic family okay. the anomic family go. type is an anti-system in anomic cultures there is no family structure you can have a nuclear family but you can also live with your clan incest is okay Marrying your cousins is okay, and if you don't want to marry your cousins, that's fine. Sometimes the youngest daughter takes care of the parents, and sometimes she doesn't. Anomic systems largely allow the individual to do whatever they want sexually and with their families. This system predominates in Southeast Asia and among the native peoples of Latin America. It used to be much larger, for example, in capital sure, Middle East Bronze Age states like Egypt or Babylon, as well as the Inca Empire. A very interesting book I've mentioned before is Joseph Heinrich's The Weirdest People in the World, which talks about how the Catholic Church banning cousin marriage was one of the biggest shifts in history since it broke down clan structures and forced Westerners to get more social trust due to mm. not having clans having to associate with broader society while creating idea. the individual. However, this kind of nuclear family is dependent upon banning incest and cousin marriage, which does not exist in these societies. The lack of any kind of structure for breeding or parenting results in societies without clear principles or stakes. The dominant political system of this part of the world has been oppressive empires ruling over disaffected peasants, with across the pre-Columbian states in the New World, the ancient Middle East, and Southeast Asia, it often being a norm for one-third the population to be slaves. Without family structures, these societies okay. and the peasantries sure. on top of them 
really don't have a concept on how to politically organize. The ruling classes of these countries, in order to balance the sexual openness of their populations, have often practiced incest in order to keep as much inside their families as possible so as to control their populations. This incest, or never looking outside their families, creates attitudes of conservatism and foolishness, which is why these countries are often so fragile and able to be conquered so quickly and easily. These are some really, really large leaps that are being made here. And I know this is all from the book, but I just I wish I knew more about this this part of the world, and I, I just don't. But it just really seems like a massive, massive leap here. As has been the case with Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Inca, or... Mesopotamia ruled for hundreds of years? ...the military ineffectiveness of Southeast Asian countries. The reason this group has... Again, would you really say the military ineffectiveness? I mean, uh, okay, sure. I mean, the, the Vietnamese military obviously was very, very effective at a certain point. ...drunk so much is its ineffectiveness, and the reason it likely survives in Southeast Asia is due to that region being the area that has faced the least military competition of anywhere in the world. I don't mean this to be a poning Southeast Asia video, because you can't judge the quality of a society based off its political and military institutions. And as I said before in my video on Southeast Asia, this is one of my favorite areas in Asia for different reasons. So if I do come across as judgmental to certain societies in this video, don't take that as a personal attack against the value of your society. Without boundaries, people really don't know where to look or how to look at the world. These societies don't really see a lot of inner-driven social change. They tend to view the world matter-of-factly and not have techniques on how to think critically about the world rather than just accepting it. If whatever works sexually works, then what other principles do you need to understand uh, again, the world in general? These societies tend to be very seems like massive generalizations, man, but okay. Culturally conservative. I guess. Where if you look at Mesoamerica, the Andeans, the Egyptians, or the Sumerians, they keep their artifacts and culture and religions basically identical for periods of 3,000 years. And there are differences in which gods are more important, but the fundamental structure is pretty similar. And if you look at Southeast Asia, I once read a history of Southeast Asia that said there was very little to none social change between 800 and 1800 AD in mainland Southeast Asia. These societies in general sure. today are chill military dictatorships. <laughs> Why does he keep saying chill? Societies tend to be military dictatorships when they don't have any other strong social institutions, since the military has to exist. These military dictatorships often face coups that the underlying structure doesn't change, yeah, and the military doesn't Myanmar. really try to change the social order, but just lets things be. Part 8, The Flexible System. <sighs> Africa is truly still vast going. and diverse, with more... It's been 56 minutes. If you're still here, congrats. ...genetic diversity than the rest of the world combined. And as well as that, True. hundreds and thousands of different ethnicities and languages. And Todd Emanuel refers to this area as the flexible. And I think it's important to note that Africa in and of itself is 54? 54, right? Maybe it's 52. 54 different countries. And so to call it as one place, uh, you know? Family system. Partially because we just do not fully understand the different True. African families. Definitely. And there is a good amount of diversity inside of Africa, yep. where the native Khoisan peoples of Southern Africa have their own communitarian family structure with a lot of gender equality. And this has influenced the Bantus migrating south, who in Southern Africa have a more monogamous and less patriarchal society, once you get to West Africa, you have very high levels of polygamy, where 50% of the female population are part of polygamous marriages, and then in East Africa, you have a separate family structure. And as we talked about before, Islam and Ethiopia are part of non-African larger family structures. The system is also called flexible because the clan has much more power vis-a-vis -vis the nuclear family. Father might not have as much influence, but the slack is picked up by various cousins, grandpas, uncles, and the like. And this is also an area of the world that practices polygamy to a much higher degree than elsewhere. In most countries before European colonialism, polygamy was practiced, but by a tiny minority of the population. In a lot of countries in Africa, it was the norm for 5% of men to have a third of the women. The flexible system predominates in Africa and echoes through its diaspora. In these societies, the actual... <laughs>
was like, what? Huh? Anyways, um, so I guess, <laughs> so I guess Northern Florida and just this one strip along here, is that along, it's probably along some sort of river or something like this. Okay, and I guess parts of Brazil here as well. Sure, sure. The family is much weaker with the clan and especially the women of the clan. I don't know why this would not be a nuclear family, but okay. Doing much of the job of raising the children. And on top of that, the men, once the they structure grow up, of society part is of often the... What? Farming and child rearing is done by women while the men <laughs> wage war and herd cattle. And Man, sometimes, like... Does he, does he double watch his videos? As Argot's fabulous book War and Human Civilization, he explains how this system of polygamy often plays out in reality. In a polygamous society in which a few men have most of the women, it creates a large class of sexless young men as a force in society in of itself who live and fight together. As Ralph Linton says in his incredible The Tree of Culture, he talks about how the norm in many African cultures was for young men to live in the same tent as a war band from puberty onwards and wage war together. This sure. is since in a society in which so many women are in the hands of a small amount of men, it creates no sex for large amounts of young men who in turn turn to violence so as to take women or to improve their social status. This creates large amounts of violence hmm. in which societies of polygamy often have large amounts of crime. The vast majority of the top 10 countries for polygamy are currently in a civil war. This creates a cycle in which young men wage war since they're sexually frustrated, and then in turn that kills them off, which also lowers the supply of young men, which as they die off means young women marry the older men who aren't waging war, thus making the problem even worse. This is how basically all societies in the world were until the rise of the state, but as the state lessened violence through rule of law and militaries, it forced elites to practice polygamy to a lesser extent. However, since the state's so recent in much of sub-Saharan Africa, this process is only now occurring. Likewise, the development of the plow, which only men had the strength to push, also pushed more intact families, where in previous societies and in Africa, agriculture has been done with hoes. In societies in which the nuclear family and strict family structure is weaker, with the clan being more sure. important, it allows much more male promiscuity. An interesting thing Todd Emanuel looks at is that AIDS is more powerful the less strong polygamy is, where in Islamic Africa, where polygamy is entrenched in the religion, there is no AIDS. In West Africa, with higher polygamy, it's a lot less, and... In he doesn't even sound sure as he's saying this himself. Southern Africa, which is more monogamous part of Africa, AIDS is much higher. And I really don't know why that is. As J.D. Unwin said in his fascinating book, okay. Sex and Civilization, a society's ability to control sex is indicative of its level of development. And once society has lessened sexual restrictions, their level of development falls. This is since men are incentivized to work harder if they know their paternity is assured and women to put more effort into their children. Energy is channeled into things besides getting laid, and people aren't suspicious of other people trying to compete for their sex. Fathers establish an idea of discipline for children, and without it, it's hard to have a conception of a unified god, which is pretty recent in much of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as rule of law, which is also the worst in sub-Saharan Africa <laughs> of anywhere in the world. Tribal Africa is traditionally fear-based, as opposed to Europe that's guilt-based and Asia that's shame-based. And fear-based societies are animist in their worldview, viewing reality as a series of different spirits and individual forces that have to be appeased in their own separate way, rather than creating broader principles like loyalty to nation, causal logic, rationality, religious law, and the like. This means that for lots of African male culture, they try to push prowess and power rather than integrity and responsibility. And the result of this is that if you talk to people who try to do business in Africa, it's difficult to get African workers to show up at the same time at the same day because there isn't that culture of responsibility. And this might sound like a racist rant on my part, but cross-reference this with someone who has lived or tried to work in Africa, and they'll just tell you that this is the case. Women tend to be viewed— Again, so I took a class on development in Africa— 
it was about doing business in Africa and it was and some of this was practiced but again it really just depends as he said it's just a completely diverse place right someone in Burkina Faso and someone in Cameroon are very very different right someone from Egypt and someone from South Africa Someone from Ethiopia is compared to Côte d'Azur, right? Sorry, not Côte d'Azur, that's in France. Côte d'Ivoire, right? Is completely, completely different. And so of the work that they did, they would work with individual villages where they would have five-year plans to build medical facilities. And if the villages did not adhere to these five-year plans, they would pull the funding straight up, right? And that with that responsibility that was then given, they would enact on this responsibility because they wanted to work and they wanted to build these medical facilities, right? And so uh, this is this is one thing about this whole little section here is that again, it's always talking about Africa, which it's like saying North America, where someone from New York and someone from Seattle, yeah, they're Americans, they do speak the same language, which is completely different than somewhere in Africa, right? Though generally the colonial languages, French, English, yeah, pretty much French and English are the sort of bond, bond, uh, the, the, the ones that tie everyone together. But it's still different, right? Someone from Texas and someone from New York, right? Someone from Nigeria and someone from Morocco. You know what I mean? Condescension, much of Africa, well, in fact, being the bedrock of the society. I don't want this to be an owning Africa section. Rather, part of the explanation for why Africa is the poorest area in the world. Yeah, and he makes a great point here, right? Um... When they've very really clearly advanced in almost every metric in the last century, right? And it's really going to be in a place of opportunity. And it hasn't moved from a tribal to a national level. We still have to keep... See, it and there I go committing the irony of talking about Africa as one place. <laughs> Mind, most of Africa was illiterate, had no state, organized religion and the like only a little bit more than a century ago. Yep. In that perspective, Africa's progress since has been absolutely remarkable. Likewise, Africa is already changing these norms, as evident in the declines in polygamy, almost certainly caused by the continent's mass conversion to Christianity and Islam, alongside the rise of the state, which makes wide-scale war no longer tenable. This leads me to the next point, where Africa will, over time, gradually strengthen the power of its families, and also, at the same time, become a more developed society. But also, you're seeing very... But it's also, again, it's way more complicated than just the family structure. I mean, there's so many economic issues that exist. <sighs> All right, this video is an hour and six minutes long. You get the point. Rapid changes in family structure around the world. And from that, you would expect to see massive social changes. And it really begs the question of... What huge social shifts will come from that? I mean, for example, in both Russia and China, their old big family clan lives were broken down by communism. People live in nuclear families. I think that's part of the reason for why and, those countries have yeah. such low birth rates and are having such large social problems, because their previous social structure for But then what about something like Japan that has the lowest birth rate in the world, but whatever. For millennia has been destroyed overnight. Germany today has switched from having their authoritarian family structure to having the French egalitarian nuclear family structure. So should we expect Germany to become more like France? Alternately, in the West, no. you're seeing the weakening power of the family, wherein, for example, the U.S., the African family structure is spread to much larger amounts of the white community. And if family has this much impact upon... Oh, God, now you're talking about Andrew Tate. Oh, okay. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I'm tapping out. How society develops. I'm tapping really out. That's the question. Now that half of all marriages ends in divorce, what will that do to society? That's a big problem, though. And these That's are all a questions question. for a future video. Oh, okay. And then it just stops. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Hour, seven minutes and 30 seconds, by far the longest video. Thank you very much if you've been along this whole way. If you have, write a comment down below and I will personally thank you for coming along this entire journey. Um, yeah, wow, that was a massive video. I don't feel like my first reaction was enough. And yet at the same time, I feel like doing this again, then it would just be better as a whole edited video. And so that was... A lot. Probably the most ambitious, arguably one of the more ambitious ones that he's done. But it's also all coming from this book. So I think maybe even reading the book might just be the better option. But anyways, as I said before, if you've made it this far, write a comment section, write a comment down below. Thank you very much for joining me. 
hour and eight minutes. What can I say? I appreciate your support. Take care. See you in the next one. And my God, it will not be this long. <laughs> Till then.